plants, where do they come from? Let's talk about natural habitats. What's up fellow plant enthusiasts? My name is Dylan and this is Maine's Botanicals. Today we're going to be talking about natural habitats. I wanted to make this video because I don't think we take into consideration where some of our plants originate from. And if we can try to replicate their natural environment, I think we can be more successful with growing them. So I've got an assortment of different plants here and I just wanted to go through a few kind of climates and environments so that you can kind of start to look at your plants a little bit differently and think, how can I make this plant feel more at home? Because it's just gonna be happier. So let's start, let's start with some obvious ones, uh, like this Gymnocleseum. Clearly, it's a cactus. It has a very succulent stem that's full of water and moisture that helps it survive an arid, hot environment. It has spines, which are modified leaves for protection from um, predators, for lack of a better term. And uh, it's, it's really designed to withstand harsh environments, um, at least harsh environments on the hot side of things. So if we were going to try to replicate the environment of this plant in our home, we probably wouldn't want a lot of humidity. Uh, we wouldn't want to give it a ton of water. Um, we wouldn't want it to get too cold. Uh, this is a plant that would be especially susceptible to freezing temperatures because in the desert, it never gets that cold. Uh, it'll get chilly, probably down to... 50 on a cool night, but it never gets frigid to where this plant would freeze. Now, um, one other thing to consider is this, this particular cactus is from the American Southwest. Uh, the other side of the cactus, well, I shouldn't say cactus because the only true cacti are in the family cactaceae, but similar plants called euphorbia actually originate in Africa where there are similar uh, environments and climates to the desert but it's not quite the same. So with euphorbia you'll see cactus shaped plants but you'll also see succulents like uh, the pencil cactus uh, mixed in there as well. So a similar kind of plant would be lithops. Lithops will grow between rocks and they actually look like rocks. I mean, their, their common name is living stones. So something like this, again, you wouldn't want to give it a lot of water. Uh, it's, it's very succulent. I can touch it. I can tell it's full of water. Uh, these can actually stay dry for a very long time just because where they're from, it doesn't rain a lot and they have to kind of hide themselves from predators, but they still need to photosynthesize. So if you saw this in nature, you're only going to see the top part of it. I'm trying to do it on the camera here. You're only going to see like this top part. And if you're walking over it, you might miss it. You won't even see that they're there. So something like this, again, wouldn't need a lot of humidity. It wouldn't want soil that retains moisture. It wants something that's fast draining because it, it exists in a place in nature that is fast draining when it rains. It rains, all the water washes over it, and then it washes away or dries up. So it's not something that you would want to be sitting in water for any period of time. Uh, kind of similar to this guy, Talansia, which is uh, technically a bromeliad in bromeli bromelidaceae. I don't know if I'm saying that family right. But uh, this, this would be let's say nestled in a big tree, nestled in like the crook of a big tree, just kind of chill in there. It doesn't actually have roots. Uh, it just sort of sits there and it absorbs nutrients from rainwater, uh, water that will maybe just wash off of the leaves of the bigger tree or rain that touches it directly. And it never ever sits in soil. Like it spends its whole life as an epiphyte, which is basically a plant that lives on another plant, but it's not parasitic. It lives its whole life sitting on the crook of this tree, just chilling, just sits there. So you would never want to plant this in soil. Uh, you really, I don't think you can do these with hydroponics either, just because 
we haven't done this video yet, but for the, the care of a Tillandsia, when you mist it, you don't want it to stay upright like this because if water gets down in here and gets down into this part, it'll actually rot it because these are not supposed to be in water for longer than it would take for rain to wash over it and then to have the sun dry it out. So again, something like this benefits from humidity and you kind of have to mist it regularly so that it stays alive. Uh, so this isn't a plant that you would want to have, let's say you had a room in your house that was just had cacti in it and you kind of kept that room really dry and warm and brightly lit. Uh, you wouldn't want something like this in there because it's not going to survive. That would be cool to have a room just for cacti. I would enjoy that quite a bit. What else do I got? Ah, this one's really deceptive. So this is Arucaria, the Norfolk Island pine. And typically when we think of pines, and this is a tree, make no mistake, but typically when we think of pine trees, we think, oh wow, they are really designed to withstand harsh, cold environments and um, withstand the desiccation of freezing wind and frost and snow and things. Well, for most pines, that is true. But for this one, we have to think about where this comes from. Most of the species of Araucaria actually grow in South America and in the South Pacific. So islands like Indonesia, uh, New Zealand, Australia, things like that. And Norfolk Island is actually a little island off the coast of Australia, off to the east. Uh, so it doesn't get cold there. It doesn't really snow and get frigid and crazy there. That's not where these grow. These grow in a place where there's lots of moisture and it rains regularly. So if you've ever had a Norfolk Island pine and you've struggled with it, you probably aren't watering it enough or giving it enough humidity because these guys don't like to dry out. They don't want to be in sopping wet soil by any means, but they don't like to dry out. The, the bottom the bottom branches and everything will just crumble or turn yellow or brown and they just, they'll just fail. Um, and they won't grow back either, so just something to keep in mind. But that's just, that's an example of how our preconceptions of plants can kind of hinder us from giving them the appropriate care. Um, another, another kind of uh, water humid related example would be ferns. Uh, this is an Asplenium, bird's nest fern. This is actually one of the hardier ferns you can buy. You can see that it just looks, <laughs> it looks hardy, like the leaves and everything are very, very stiff. Um, they're thick, so they're, they're not going to be as affected by low humidity. Um, but yeah, ferns grow in the understory of the forest where they get dappled sunlight. They never get direct sun, and it's always kind of a little more on the cool side and very moist and who is it that doesn't like that word but we wouldn't want to put a fern in a dry place in our house because it's not going to succeed there and as a matter of fact there are some species of fern that are extremely susceptible to low humidity uh, adiantum the maidenhair fern or uh, the hartley fern the the uh, genus name is escaping me those those need humidity. Maidenhair ferns really make better terrarium plants because they they can have that controlled humid environment that will never dry out. So they're not really something that I would ever have growing on my shelves back here because my humidity right now is at like, I think it's at 55 or 60 percent. That's not high enough. That's not going to be good enough for them. They, they're just so lacy and delicate that they need like 70 or 80 percent, which is really hard to replicate in your house without causing like mold issues. Uh, what's another good example as far as environments go? Carnivorous plants. Oh, carnivorous plants come from places like bogs that have very nutrient poor soil. And that's why they kind of evolved to trap insects because they had to supplement their kind of nutri nutritional deficiencies. Um, so because of that, things like Dionea, like the Venus flytrap, that, that's really hard to grow uh, successfully because the soil kind of has to be nutrient poor. It has to be a little more on the acidic side, which is kind of hard to do. Um, and 
it has to be moist at all times. It's one of the few plants where you can actually have it be more on the wet side consistently all the time. And they need constant humidity, and of course they need to you know, eat insects and stuff. They're kind of a pain, but that is a whole hobby in itself. And eventually I will make a video on carnivorous plants, I promise. But right now, <laughs> let's just get through the basics first. Uh, pitcher plants like Nepenthes, uh, Saracenia, those are a little bit easier. Uh, they're a little hardier, thicker, um, especially Nepenthes. I think if you're gonna have success with a carnivorous plant, Nepenthes is a good one to try. Uh, Pinguicula is a good one too, which kind of looks like a, kind of like an Echeveria, but its its leaves are very sticky so that it can trap, you know, things like fungus gnats. Uh, what other carnivorous plants are there? Uh, uh, Drosera, the sundew plants. Ugh, don't even bother. <laughs> I mean, you just need those, that, again, that's like a terrarium plant, just because they're so thin and delicate. They just, they need that controlled environment. Uh, what else, what else? Oh, like Epiprimnum. There again is an example of an epiphyte. Epiprimnum is attached to a bigger tree, so it can get it can get bright and direct light, but it's probably not going to get full sun, and it's not going to want to be in a soil that retains a ton of moisture because those roots are typically attached to a tree, not buried in the soil. So it'll be a little more susceptible to root rot, for instance. Same concept with the cacti; like they are they are in something like sand that is fast draining. It's not gonna retain water and the heat's just gonna bake all of the moisture out of the sand anyway. Uh, and actually cacti have kind of thinner, uh, more shallow roots because there's no reason for them to have deep roots like a tree would. You know, a tree gets a big tap root that goes into the groundwater and everything and it can really like, especially like willow trees, the roots of willow trees are extremely invasive. Um, they'll bust through like sewer pipes, swimming pools. I mean, th they go for it. They want that water, baby, so they're gonna get it. Um, what else? I don't know. I don't know, is, is any of this making sense? Like, just when you have, I have a lot of plants, so I don't necessarily think about this all the time, but if, you, if you're buying a new plant, think about, can I give this plant a home that's going to be similar to where it originates from because that's how it's going to be the happiest. If if you have if you have a really dry house and your humidity is never above 30 or 40 percent, you're probably not going to grow ferns. You know, succulents and cacti are going to be a better choice because you're going to be able to keep them around longer. Or you know, plants that have thicker, waxier leaves like Epiprimnum or Syndapsis has pretty thick, waxy leaves. You can just kind of look at plants with a botanical eye, like the eye of a botanist, and think, what are the physical characteristics? Where does this plant come from? And that's gonna help you take care of it. Just look a little bit deeper into it. Anyway, hopefully that all made sense. This video made a lot more sense when I thought of it. <laughs> so hopefully you guys got something out of this. I think that's all I have about this topic. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have anything to add to this. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other environments where plants grow. Oh, aquatic plants? Well, I mean, they grow underwater. <laughs> Can't grow aquatic plants outside of the water because that's not how it works. Uh, like uh, Anubius, I don't think there's any terrestrial species of Anubius. I think they're all underwater. But then you have plants like lily pads. Um, what is the species of water lily? Nymph I think the family's like Nymphaceae or something. Anyway, I forget the, the genus, but water lilies, you know, their roots are underwater, but they flower above water and they have the, they have the lily pad to photosynthesize with. Fascinating that like something like that exists. Uh, there's a little kind of water pond here and I love it in the summer and everything, going and seeing those just because I'm so interested by them. I wish we could grow those inside. You probably can't because you wouldn't get enough light, but it'd be cool if they had like houseplant water lilies. Somebody tell me if that's a thing. Anyway, enough rambling. Let me know what you guys think. Um, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing. And uh, until the next video, I will see you guys very soon. Thank you.